Good morning and welcome to worship here at Shepherd of the Hills. So as of two weeks ago, the wheat field behind my house is gone. But of course, that's why the farmer planted it. He planted it in order to harvest it. And Jesus is going to remind us today that the same thing is true for us as Christians. Jesus has made us God's people by faith in him for the great day of harvest in order to bring us home to heaven. So today, Jesus' message to us is simply, live as those who await the day of judgment, the great harvest day. Let's begin our worship today with our opening hymn, hymn 221, Blessed Jesus at Your Word. Our order of service today begins with the invocation, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. O Lord, our Lord, how glorious is your name in all the earth. 
Almighty God, merciful Father, you crown our life with your love. You take away our sin. You comfort our spirit. You make us pure and holy in your sight. You did not spare your only Son, but gave him up for us all. O Lord, our Lord, how glorious is your name in all the earth. O Son of God, eternal word of the Father, you came to live with us. You made your Father known. You washed us from our sins in your own blood. You are the King of glory. You are the Lord. O Lord, our Lord, how glorious is your name in all the earth. Let us pray. Almighty God, plant your word into our hearts and cause it to grow, that we may remain firm in our faith, glorify you with godly living, and look forward to your return with confidence. We ask this in the name of your Son and our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And children, you may now gather together as we continue with the children's object lesson. Hi there, kids. I hope your day is going well. I brought with me some things from my office that uh, can sometimes make me sad. Here is my tape. I use my tape to, to keep things together, but sometimes my tape runs out and I don't have it when I need it. Here's one of my markers. I use my markers to mark things or maybe sometimes to draw on the whiteboard, but sometimes they stop working. The ink in them runs out. This is a package of nuts. I love these almonds. They are delicious as a snack, but as you can see, they ran out. I ate them all and they're gone. Here's a pad of paper. And I've got, I think, about 10 sheets left. It runs out, too. It comes to an end. Here's my calendar. Today is August 2nd, but one day this day is going to come to an end. And all of time, all of life here on earth is one day going to come to an end. Not just these things, but everything in the world will come to an end on the last day, on Judgment Day when Jesus comes back. Maybe you and I will die before then and will come to an end. Everything, everybody comes to an end. And that would be kind of sad, except that Jesus lasts forever, and his promises last forever, and he promises that you and I will last forever. When he comes back on Judgment Day, this world will end, but Jesus says he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth and that we get to be there because he loved us and he died for our sins and rose again so we could live with him forever. So everything will come to an end, but because Jesus doesn't and because his love and promises don't come to an end, we will not come to an end either. When Judgment Day comes, we will be taken into heaven. Jesus will not send us to hell where we deserve to be for our sins because he's forgiven us. We will be with him forever. So, how does Jesus want us to live until that day comes? Do you think he wants us to be selfish? Do you think he wants us to make our lives all about me and what I want? Absolutely not. He wants us to, to simply keep believing in him and to keep living a life of love for others that shows how much he loves others through us. He wants us to keep telling people about him so they can live forever too and be with us forever in heaven when that day comes. Can we do that on our own? Nope, we need his help. So let's ask for his help right now because we can be confident he loves us and will give us the help we need to stay faithful and live for him until the day of judgment comes. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we are weak, but you are strong. You are our Savior. So help us to keep hearing your word that keeps us strong in our faith in you. 
Keep working love in us so that we can live a life of love for others and show others your love and tell them about your love until the day when you return so that heaven may be filled with as many people as possible who trust in you. Amen. Thank you. Our first lesson for today is our Old Testament lesson from Joel chapter 3, verses 12 through 16. So are you like me? I need two things in order to be ready for Judgment Day. Because I have a sinful nature, I need to be reminded of something I too easily neglect, that Judgment Day is coming, and something my sinful nature doesn't want me to believe, that I deserve to be condemned by a holy God on that day. I need that reminder to take Judgment Day and to take God seriously. But I also need something for my faith, the comfort and reassurance that when Judgment Day comes, God will not condemn me, but be my refuge from condemnation because he is my Savior. Listen in our Old Testament lesson to how God gives us both of the messages that we need to be ready for Judgment Day. The prophet Joel writes, Let the nations be roused. Let them advance into the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the nations. Swing the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come trample the grapes, for the winepress is full and the vats overflow, because their wickedness is so great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon will be darkened and the stars will stop shining. The Lord will roar from Zion and shout from Jerusalem. The sky and the earth will tremble. But the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. This is our Old Testament lesson. Our epistle lesson for this morning is from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. So every day we get closer to Judgment Day, the need to pray for God to keep us in the faith and to keep us living a life that brings God glory and to keep sharing the good news of Jesus becomes more and more urgent. But be honest, do your prayers have that specific spiritual focus because you always live your life every day in light of the knowledge of the day of judgment? Well, thankfully, the Apostle Paul reminds us that the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. He intercedes for us, asking the Father to give us all we need to be faithful until that day comes. Paul writes, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we should pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that are not expressed in words. And he who searches our hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to God's will. Our verse of the day, Alleluia, my word will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. These words are written that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. The gospel lesson for today is recorded in Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30, and verses 36 through 43. What is your job until Judgment Day comes? Is it to judge who is truly worthy of Judgment Day, who is truly a believer and who is not, and despise those who are not? No, your job and mine is to live a humble life of faith in Jesus, a humble life of love right alongside unbelievers in the world, to show them the love of Jesus and to tell them about that saving love so that heaven may be filled with many on the great day of judgment, the great day of the harvest. Hear these words of Jesus in our gospel lesson. He, that is Jesus, presented another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while people were sleeping, the enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the plants sprouted and produced heads of grain, the weeds also appeared. The servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where did the weeds come from? He said to them, An enemy did this. The servants asked him, 
Do you want us to go and gather up the weeds? No, he answered, because when you gather up the weeds, you might pull up the wheat along with them. Let both grow until the harvest, and at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, first gather up the weeds, bind them in bundles, and burn them. Then gather the wheat into my barn. Then Jesus sent the people away and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered them, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the word. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the son of, sons of the evil one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. The reapers are angels. Therefore, just as the weeds are gathered up and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the world. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will pull out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and those who continue to break the law. The angels will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Our, her, our sermon hymn is hymn 472, Rise My Soul to Watch and Pray. Grace and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon text for today is the gospel lesson we just read from Matthew chapter 13. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, on a beautiful and perfectly clear September morning, 2001, a Boeing 767 passenger plane 
flew into the North Tower of the World Trade Center, creating a gigantic fireball and a gigantic black plume of smoke. Fifteen minutes later, another Boeing passenger plane flew into the South Tower of the World Trade Center in Manhattan with the same devastating results. A little over a half an hour after that, another Boeing passenger plane crashed into the Pentagon, the headquarters of the U.S. Department of Defense, again creating a huge explosion and an intense fire. All three of these incidents led to the loss of thousands of lives. Our nation on September 1st, 2001, was stunned. Passenger planes used as weapons? How could this happen? Who would do this? What's going to happen next? Why did this happen? What in the world is going on? What in the world is going on is also the question that jumps out from our lesson. When Jesus tells the story of a farmer who sowed wheat seed in his field, and then later his servants went and checked on the field, and they found weeds that had been planted in that field, they asked the question to the farmer, to their master, what's going on? Didn't you plant wheat seed? How come there are weeds that have been planted in the field. What happened? What in the world is going on? Now, I realize it's not exactly fair to compare the events of 9-11, the the devastating tragic events, with the, the, the far less important weeds being planted in a wheat field to ruin the crop. But you should understand that Jesus isn't really telling a story about weeds growing in a wheat field. He's using this story to pull back the curtain of everyday ordinary life to show us what in the world is going on behind the scenes. And what is behind the scenes is every bit as terrible as what happened on 9-11. God and his kingdom are being attacked. There is an enemy who is working against God. He's secretly plotting spiritual destruction and chaos Lives have been lost. Lives will be lost. So much is at stake. So let's listen carefully today. As Jesus pulls back the curtain of everyday life to tell us what in the world is really going on in this cosmic spiritual struggle behind the scenes. Not only so that we better understand the reality of life, but so that we know what our role is in this struggle and we know where all of this is leading. So here's how Jesus explains this story he tells about the weeds sown in the wheat field. He says, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. The kingdom of heaven is kind of how God does things, how he rules over things in light of Jesus Christ, his son, sent to be the savior of fallen mankind. Jesus explains that the farmer in this story is really him. He says, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. In other words, believers. So we should understand, first of all, that God has one essential objective for us living here on this planet. His goal is to plant good seed, to make believers out of us. His goal is to lead us all to the knowledge of our salvation in Jesus and to faith in him. And Jesus made that very clear in John 6, verse 40, when he said, My Father's will, his essential will, is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day, Jesus promises. So think about what Jesus is saying. God's essential objective for you and everybody else in this world is not that you find happiness in whatever makes you happy. God's essential goal for you is not that you achieve your full potential, that you become successful and prosperous in whatever you do. His essential purpose for you in life is not that you 
work hard to put an end to injustice and poverty and hunger, and in general, that you leave this fallen world a better place than you found it when you came into this world. Your essential purpose in life, according to God, is not that you prove how much you love your family and your friends by all that you do for them, or even that you prove to God how much you love him by how devoted you are in your religious practices. Now, everybody in the world almost thinks that that's what the purpose of life is, but not God. And that's because God knows what you and I really need. If you're in the middle of the ocean and you're drowning, do you need to achieve your full potential? Do you need to show love to your family? Do you need to be successful? Do you need to end injustice? (laughs) What you need in that moment is to be saved. And God better than we can ever see it, sees this entire world, all of humanity, drowning in a sea of sin caused by the evil that exists in all of us and needing rescuing. We fall so far short of the good that God expects of us, the ultimate good, that trying to cling to our goodness in the hope that that's going to save us, would be like drowning in the middle of the ocean and holding on to some splinters of wood and thinking they're going to hold us up. So God knows we need rescuing and that we can't do it ourselves, so he sent his son. He sent his son to live the life of ultimate goodness we all fail to live for us. He sent his son to die the death of perfect love we need, that sacrifice we need, his life being offered for our sins on the cross to pay for our sins and all our forgiveness. The Son of Man, the God who became a man to save us, is the one responsible for all of the good in you, all of the good that has been done for you by him. He's your Savior. When you needed saving, he not only gave his life for you, he brought you to faith in him through the powerful message of his saving love in the gospel. So, your life as a Christian, the life of joy you have to know that that God actually loves someone like you, a sinner as much of a failure as you are, your life of peace to know that God doesn't see, he doesn't even think about all of the ways you failed to be the person you know he wants you to be because you're so completely forgiven in Jesus. Your life of hope that is the certainty that no matter what you're going through, God's going to be with you and get you through it and bring you safely to perfect eternal life with him in heaven. Your life that is your desire, your striving to serve God and others, which is clearly always imperfect, but also is still used by God to have a positive impact on others and to testify to his love, all of that is from Jesus. All of the good sown in this world, sown in your life and mine, comes from the Son of Man, comes from Jesus. How thankful you and I can be no matter what troubles or sufferings are in, your, in our lives right now. But there's an enemy of Jesus And in this story, the enemy is the one who comes in the middle of the night and sows weed seed in the farmer's field where he has planted wheat. Jesus identifies this enemy in his work as the devil when he says, the weeds are the sons of the evil one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. Now, don't think that the work of the devil is to plant really bad people here and there throughout the world. 9-11 terrorists and rapists and serial killers and child abusers and um, corrupt CEOs of greedy companies and bad cops and violent protesters. The devil is responsible for, for putting really evil people in the world. That is true. But don't forget that Jesus said about the devil in John 8 verse 44, he's a liar and the father of lies. Lies are his essential weapon. And his favorite lie is, is a really simple one. You don't need God. You don't need him to take care of you. You can take care of yourself. You don't need him to save you. You're a good person. You don't need him to show you the best way of li- to live. You can figure that out on your own. 
So the people who believe his lies are, are not just overtly really evil people. Sometimes they're polite young people, and sometimes they are devoted mothers and kind grandfathers and highly ethical co-workers who simply have been convinced by the devil's lies that they don't need Jesus to their spiritual harm and even their spiritual damnation. And notice how the devil spreads his lies. The enemy of the farmer comes secretly under the cover of night to sow those weeds in the farmer's field. The weeds are going to take a while to grow. Nobody's going to even know that they're there. But that's okay. The enemy of the farmer is patient. If it takes a while for those weeds to grow and start, it, and start to ruin the wheat field, he's okay with that. He's patient. The devil is also very deceptive and very patient. His goal is ultimately to attack the ultimate truth that Jesus is the Savior of the world so people don't believe the message of the gospel and are not saved. But he's okay with attacking that message indirectly, subtly, secretly, and slowly. So he may just plant in you the idea that it's okay for you not to believe that, that every single crazy miracle story in the Bible actually happened as long as that's the start of you beginning to doubt the word of God. What he may do is just plant in you the idea that uh, the Bible's definition of marriage is, is too narrow for today or that the Bible's emphasis on the nuclear family today is, is just unrealistic as long as it results in you maybe decades later, wondering if you need to believe the essential message that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, the message that is essential to your salvation. Or the devil may plant in your mind the idea that your spiritual instruction, your instruction in the Christian faith from your loving parents was really oppressive religious indoctrination. Ironically, even while you're being indoctrinated intentionally at an institution of higher learning. Or he may plant in your mind the simple idea that you don't have to do as much in the way of Christian instruction for your children as your parents did for you. You don't have to take your kids to church as much as your parents took you. You don't have to teach them about Jesus as much as your parents taught you about Jesus. As long as that means that there's a slow erosion of faith that begins with a gradual neglect of God's word so that maybe 50 years later, it's your great-grandkids who will shrug at the idea of faith in Jesus and who will do that to their spiritual harm and destruction. And there's one more important thing to understand about the work of the devil. That enemy who sowed weeds in the farmer's field sowed those weeds in the middle of the night and then he ran away to distance himself from this dastardly act so he wouldn't be associated with it. If after a slow erosion of faith, your great-grandkids become unbelievers, the devil will not lead them to conclude they are satanic. He will lead them to conclude something far more noble, that, that they're woke, that they're actually smarter than their parents or grandparents who simply believed in Jesus. So what do we do about all of this evil work of the devil in this world, his work that opposes salvation and the gospel and Christ? Well, in the story, the servants of the farmer wanted to immediately pull out the weeds and end this threat to the grain. And sadly, sometimes the church has thought that, that that's a good idea. So in the Crusades, the church thought it was a good idea to kill Muslims, unbelievers, and end that threat to the church. Or maybe in the time of the Inquisition, the church thought it was a good idea to burn at the stake those who were heretics. But the farmer told the servants, don't pull out the weeds because in the process you might pull out some of the wheat with them and you'd be defeating your purpose. Do you think it's possible that some of those Muslims killed during the Crusades, if they had simply heard the saving gospel, would have become believers and ended up in heaven? 
And what about the children of the slain crusaders who grew up without a Christian father to reinforce the Christian faith with them, who maybe in, in time became unbelievers? Or what about during the time of the in- Inquisition? Do you think it's possible that some Christians, looking at the brutality and violence of the church that represents Jesus Christ, may have thought, you know, I don't, I don't need this, and maybe secretly, silently abandoned their faith in Jesus because of what the church was doing? So it's God's plan that the wheat and the weeds coexist, that they live alongside each other in this world. Why? So that every day you can be mad and infuriated that unbelievers out there unfairly slander your character as a Christian? So that you can be mad every day at the hateful rhetoric about your Christian and biblical values? So that every day you can be upset at how this world focuses on the scandals and the flaws of the church and completely overlooks the good that it does. So that every day you can be angry at all the lies the people out there who are not believers say about how the Bible came to be. So that in the end you can just be infuriated at the violent persecution that Christians suffer in different parts of the world. Know your goal in existing alongside unbelievers is to love them and to help them and to serve them and to thereby reveal the undeserved grace of the Savior who lives in you. Jesus says your mission is to coexist alongside unbelievers so that as you humbly bear your cross for Christ, sometimes a cross they put on your back, you can show them the comfort and the strength Jesus gives his people. Your mission, alongside unbelievers, is to tell them that the Jesus who loves you loves them and died for them too and is their salvation too. So that in the end, the weeds become wheat when they see the glory of their Savior's love. Not only in your life, but especially in your words of the gospel. Because the end is coming. This cosmic battle between Christ and the devil, between the saving truth of the gospel and the lies, the damning lies of the devil, this, this battle between faith and unbelief is going to come to an end. One day the harvest is going to come, the weeds and the wheat are going to be harvested together, and sadly the weeds will be thrown into the eternal fire of hell, and the wheat believers will happily be brought safely into the barn to live in safety and security with God forever in heaven. This is Jesus' answer to the question, what in the world is going on? And where is it leading? So live securely in his answer. For by his grace, he has made you his wheat so that you can live in his love in this life and end up living forever safely with him in heaven and live purposely and purposefully until that day comes as well. Knowing that God has left you here in this world, in the midst of unbelievers, so that by your life of love and by your proclamation of your Savior's love in the gospel, heaven may be filled with many. Amen. The peace of God which transcends understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We confess our faith this morning in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. 
We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us now join in the prayer of the church. Gracious God and Father, we praise you for the countless blessings which we receive from your hand, the beauties of creation and the bounties of the earth, the joy of life and the pleasure of friendship, the good of work and the gift of rest, the privilege to share happiness and sorrow with one another. Above all, we praise and thank you for your saving word and for your Son's body and blood which you give us to eat and to drink in the sacrament. Through these means of grace, you send the Holy Spirit into our hearts and unite us to Jesus and to the whole Christian church on earth. Strengthen us through this heavenly food. Increase our trust in Christ and our love for one another. Great God and Lord, without your continuing help, we easily waver in our faith, lose courage, and grow careless in our watchfulness. The times and days are perilous. Give us strength to face the evils of each day with fresh confidence. Open our lips to speak of your grace and move us to use the gifts that you give us to share your word of salvation with all people. Protect and prosper the family, the school, the government, and all good institutions that you have established for the benefit of society. Remember in mercy those who are sick and suffering and bring your healing to troubled homes and lives. Move us to pray for those in need and to help them with deeds of kindness. Father, today we remember before your throne of grace Simone Brown, who is recovering from shoulder surgery, Jerry Rexon and Dwayne Brown, who will be undergoing surgery this week, Tom Gulick, who has been hospitalized with a serious infection, the family and friends of Bruce Case, the grandfather of Travis Madison and Jake Tahaney, as they grieve his loss. And we remember as well all of the people in our nation and around the world who are affected by this pandemic, that you, Lord, would show mercy in this time and that you would work through all things for the good of the people you love. We also thank you today for giving the gift of a daughter, Evelyn, to Aaron and Emily Platzer, and we ask that you would keep both mother and daughter in your gracious care. And now hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Now, eternal God and Father, keep us in the saving faith and so enable us to overcome all things through our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We'll conclude our service with our closing hymn.
May God bless your week with his grace, and may he keep you faithful until that great day of his return.